an acolyte kills the dream. All right, Patrick Klepek, it's time to talk here on Decoding TV about The Acolyte. Episodes one and two have premiered. They are entitled Lost Slash Found and Revenge Slash Justice. Uh, we are going to shortly be spoiling everything in these two episodes. Uh, Patrick and I have watched the first two episodes. We have not watched further for the purpose of this conversation. So let's get into it, Patrick. In one sentence, approximately or less, should people watch The Acolyte? I think so. I like it. I don't love it. I wanted to love this show, like the premise, like the framing, like the storytelling ideas, but I need to see where this goes before I have a better sense of whether the whole picture comes together. All right. I got to say, I think this is worth checking out. So if you're on the fence, I would give it a watch. I think there's enough stuff here that's interesting to make it worth considering. So far, this is my second favorite Star Wars TV show that they've made. Uh, the first favorite being Andor. Uh, so, yeah, I I would recommend The Acolyte. Uh, but let's get into it. There's so much more to discuss, and I want to hear more about, like, what holds you back from giving this a full recommend, Patrick Klepek? I mean, do you want to get into that right now? Uh, like what? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know? there's, like, a, a broadly, uh, I feel like I'm watching a follow-up series to a series I didn't see. Um some of what kind of doesn't work for me on like the, the broadest possible level is just like, I feel like I'm arriving at these characters in stride where there are like moments and reveals that happen in these first two episodes that would land so much harder if I had any history with these characters whatsoever. And it ends up making reveals feel, I don't, I don't know. They just don't land nearly as hard. Like I'm not familiar with this era of star Wars. I'm not familiar with the dynamics of these Jedi and like how they fit into the culture. And so, I don't know. I just feel like I'm catching up midstream in these episodes in a way that, uh, I, I found a little wanting. That's interesting because this show I think was designed to be appealing to people who have no real connection with Star Wars in general these days. Like it it's takes place a hundred years before the events that we see in the original Star Wars trilogy. Uh, or I, I think actually before the um before even the prequel, the prequel trilogy, yeah, right? Yeah. Before the prequel trilogy. And so uh you, you should theoretically be able to come to this with no baggage, just watch it without any of that stuff, and no Skywalkers in this movie, as far as we know in the show. And um, I actually think it largely works as that. Uh, but it, it sounds like for you. We, we are intercepting these characters. They already all have all these connections in history, right? Yeah. In, in the show. And you felt a little bit kind of left behind, uh, it, it sounds like, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Like, I mean, there are, like, there, there are early moments like when, you know, like our main character is staring into some fire and having a dramatic, mm -hmm. like, like a traumatic, re like, re like mental retelling of like something that happens. Like, I don't feel anything in this moment because I have no content. I don't know. I just, I... I, I felt like in the first episode, I feel like I'm like I missed and I feel like I missed an episode setting up more of some of these characters and the dynamics. But um, but I don't know that it sounds like maybe you didn't feel that way as much. No, um, I was mildly annoyed by another dynamic, which I see in a lot of Star Wars shows, <laughs> which is uh, uh, which is people repeating exposition to each other that we, the viewer, already know. Like that seemed to happen quite a bit. It, it happened, it seemed like it was nonstop in Ahsoka. Like, that was all that show was, was people just telling things, sharing things that people already knew, and the plot seemed to move glacially. <laughs> Here, it's it's less pronounced, but it's like, there's characters just repeating information that we, as the viewer, already know, and I always think that's a little bit annoying. But that's that's a very minor problem. It's not really, you know, that, that was, but it's kind of related to what you're saying of, like, how are these characters engaged? What is the substance of their interactions, basically? That was the thing that I felt more was an issue, but... Uh, let's get into what actually happened this episode. So episode one begins with a uh, title card or text on the screen that says, a hundred years before the rise of the empire. Can't do a, a scroll. Can't do a scroll. Can't do a scroll. Can't do a scroll. Like, this is just a scroll. This is just a scroll. Like, what are we doing? Not enough text. Not enough text. Uh, so it is a time of peace. The Jedi Order and the Galactic Republic have prospered for centuries without war. But in the dark corners of the galaxy, a powerful few learn to use the Force in secret. One of them, a lone assassin, risks seeking discovery, uh, risks discovery to seek revenge. So that's the intro to the text. Now, I wanted to know a little bit more about what this era meant, like what 
what was Star Wars like at this time? So I reached out to my buddy, Peter Serena, who hosts the Ordinary Adventures YouTube channel. And I asked him a bunch of questions about like, what's, <laughs> what's Star Wars? Like what's, uh-huh. what, what's happening in this time period? And Peter responded, during this era, the Republic is experiencing a golden age of peace and expansion around the galaxy. The Jedi Order is at its peak. They are trusted by everyone. Uh, Peter also guessed that they said it during this time to get away from any other movies or TV shows. You don't have any crossover characters. You don't need to have watched 1,800 episodes of The Bad Batch or Clone Wars or whatever (laughs) to understand what's going on in this thing. Uh, But yeah, uh, even but despite the fact that it's a very prosperous time for the Jedi, even during this time, there's some cracks that are starting to show in the armor. So that's kind of what's going on. I also, by the way, asked... What's the deal with Jedi? Like, what are Jedi in this universe at this point in time? They're basically, because to me, they basically seem like space cops, right? Yeah. To be during this time. Yeah. And uh, Peter said, that's true, but they also do diplomatic missions. They're peacekeepers, ambassadors, and explorers, helping the Republic pioneer the Outer Rim. I guess they also provide support in the same way that priests or, you know, uh, that priests would mm-hmm. as well. You know, so that's kind of the table setting of, what we, where we are in this universe, what Jedi do, they're space cops. They just called this show Space Cops. I think that would have <laughs> that would have gone better. All right. Anyway, we begin the episode on Ueda, a woman matching the description of somebody named Osha, walks in and meets uh, this woman named Master and Indara. So uh, Osha, someone who looks like Osha, meets Master Indara. Uh, Osha is played by Amanda Stenberg. Master Indara is played by Carrie Ann Moss. Osha, quote unquote, says, we have unfinished business. Attack me with all your strength. And what follows is, I have to say, a pretty kick-ass action scene. Yeah. Uh, This is some of the best. This show has some of the best head-to-head fight scenes in any Star Wars that I've seen since the prequel trilogy, basically. I think... It's super cool to the way they use martial arts. It's 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 wuxia, like a, a genre of of uh, movies, and uh, specifically, you know, Hong Kong Chinese martial arts movies. Is there something that, that defines that, like more specifically, like like what the hallmark is of that specific style? Uh, one of them is uh, like like aesthetically, one of them is like wire work. Okay, uh, but it, it it's also like the the kind of character archetypes that appear in, in those movies as well, kind of define it as well. But they have a very specific look to them because often they use like why, like people move in specific ways. They jump and dance in specific ways. And um, yeah, and they're often about like these kind of epic mythological conflicts. Uh, so yeah, this, this, this show explicitly is heavily inspired by those movies. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon is probably the closest thing that most American audiences will understand. That movie was also inspired by kind of classic Chinese wuxia movies. So that's kind of like an, a, a more American version. I see. A more Americanized version of those things. That's still very authentic. Uh, but yeah, uh, this is this clearly is kind of wears its heart on its sleeve in that regard. And there's just a ton of cool moments in this action scene, you know, the assassin is using these little dagger thingies and is able to manipulate the force and use the daggers in really cool ways. Um, I thought this was great. Any comments on this opening scene, Patrick Lepic? No, I, I agree. It gives like a really strong visual identity uh, to at least what you hope is going to be like the approach to fight choreography. I know that you were very mixed on, well, okay. Mixed is the wrong word. Uh, hated uh, the storytelling in Ahsoka, but one of the things that you, <laughs> one of the things that we did at least, you know, we both on Common Ground on was there were some real highlights in the the combat sequences, like in Ahsoka. They found unique ways to depict like stuff we've seen a million times before. Like a person's yeah. got a lightsaber, they've got the Force that should provide you with a lot of options, but instead that has been a pretty limited box that we have seen um, over Star Wars history, and here. I mean, part of what's like really magical about the sequence, I think, is that it, it, you know, it gestures at or it shows explicitly, hey, like this box is a lot bigger. Like, like you can do a lot more here if you like, kind of put your mind to it and and let your mind wander. And I think this sequence in particular is great. even the way the the assassination like happens, like the setup yeah. and how it uses the dynamics of the force against a Jedi, like it holds off the lightsaber to the last possible. It's not the focus. Like it's, it's other parts of, of combat and fighting. And, and it's just, it's really 
fun to watch and, and sets a really fascinating tone for what the show is trying to communicate in theory about like how it views the force and fight and fighting and violence in this specific flavor of star Wars. Right. There's that moment when she, uh, delivers the killing blow. It's when she, she, the, the assassin like throws a dagger at somebody else in the bar and then master and Dara is distracted. And so then she uses that to like, Actually it delivering, I was know? like, yeah. I, I thought it worked like functionally as a distraction for the audience. So that even though when you realize what happened, you're like, oh, yeah, of course, that's what would happen. I don't know. It worked as a really good kind of aha moment, both in how they're setting up this particular kill and also just the the editing and choreo. I don't know. I, I, thought, I thought that all was a real highlight of these two episodes. I agree. And I mean, I have to, if I could show you a graph of my emotional excitement, during the scene, <laughs> it is, it goes like through the roof because we're seeing Carrie Ann Moss, yep. who's a complete badass in the Matrix movies. Uh, I, I mean, uh, unless you're a child of the nineties, you don't understand like the, pl- the, the place that Carrie Ann Moss occupies in, in one's, you know, pop culture obsessed nerds mind. But like, she was so cool in those movies. Mm-hmm. And then to see her doing Basically the same thing. You know, she's fighting against this assassin. She's so calm during this scene and deflecting and doing everything. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, my dreams are coming true. This <laughs> this scene makes better use of Carrie on Moss than Matrix Resurrections did, in my opinion. I, right? I, li- I like that movie a lot more than you did, I think. Yeah. But I agree with you. Like, it's a better fighting sequence than anything Absolutely. in that film. <laughs> exactly. So it's like, this is like so exciting. And then my... Emotional state came crashing to the ground. No, when I realized that Carrie Ann Moss is killed in the opening scene, she's part of the marketing for this movie. And no, I and felt it's like, deceived. oh, we're gonna get a Carrie Ann Moss se- series, and now maybe she's gonna come back as a force ghost or some shit like that. But like, I was really disappointed, or, or we're gonna find out that she didn't actually die in this scene, you know, like maybe, um. The character who assassinated her dreamed this scene. You know, who knows? Whatever. Uh, like, I think she's dead. I think unfortunately, she's dead. I think she's dead, <laughs> and I was crushed because she was so good in the scene, and that sucked. That sucked. But you know, hey, uh, I'm glad we got to have a scene with Carrie Moss that was really, really cool. And just seeing the force used in a bar brawl is great. Yeah. yeah. Already, I'm like, hey, Patrick, it feels great to be excited about a Star Wars thing again. Right? Agreed. That's for me. For me. Um, and you know what's also great? Watching a Star Wars show where people talk like normal human beings. That's <laughs> that's just I take for granted that so much, you know? And now and then after watching like shows like Ahsoka, I'm like, oh wow. Uh, but now we're back. We're back, baby. People inter- you know, there there are some flaws, but for the most part, people speak in normal <laughs> conversation cadence. And I love that for us. Uh, that's for those who are new listeners to decoding TV, I'm making fun of the fact that on Ahsoka, people spoke incredibly slowly and ponderously Mm -hmm. uh and i really did not like that okay osha wakes up on a spaceship at the first when i first saw this i was like did she dream that whole thing you know like what was going on Mm -hmm. there anyway she's on the ship as a mechnic a person who repairs stuff on the ship uh also the ship seems to be run by nymodians uh do you do you remember nymodians from the phantom menace yeah i'm yeah these, these kind of like alien looking creatures with no noses uh, they were actually racist caricatures in that movie. And I'm just going to say, I'm glad they ditched the racist caricature uh, accents for this show. Uh, they, they they seem to be a mix of different voices on the Acolyte, which is great. Uh, but anyway, I wrote a whole essay about that a long time ago. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. I think if you, if you, I think if you, it might still be live if you Google Dave Chen, Phantom Menace. Yeah, uh, racism and ethnic stereotypes in Star Wars Phantom Menace. So check that out. But yeah, uh, they got rid of that. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> They're not doing that anymore. Basically, if you go back to Phantom Menace and watch like those opening scenes, those guys speak with like broken Asian accents. Oh, and, and, they have no, no, and they have no noses, you know, which is like a racist way to depict Asian people. So um, yeah, but they're, they're not doing it anymore, Patrick. So um, <laughs> I'm acknowledging progress. the progress. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Jedi show up to the cargo ship to investigate the murder of Andara, and people are not super happy about it. I like that they're just, I, I, I like that, you know, the the place that Jedi occupy for Star Wars fans, like, ooh, they're so cool. We love to be like them. You know, when you're growing up watching Star Wars, it's like, oh, yes, Jedi, so awesome. Yes, amazing. 
that's how I spent most of my life was thinking of Jedi as like cool badasses. Uh, but no one likes it when the cops show up. And uh, <laughs> that's kind of what the show brings up is, hey, what, what if there were just like cops and they show up and they're they're rooting around your shit. They're messing up your mind. You know, they're reading your mind using their force powers. Like that would be pretty annoying, right? I mean, I think it's the first, maybe it's present in other Star Wars media. Like, I can't think of one off the top of my head that acknowledges, and I, now I can see this, like the go woke, go broke crowd. Be like, oh, we're bringing consent to the Star Wars universe. But I think it's the front, it's multiple <laughs> times in these episodes, yeah. there is like, a remark made about like, like come on come on man like fucking stay don't, out like of don't there. use like, don't use the mind reading powers on yeah, me like, don't yeah don't don't do the mind control on me that's very uncool right yeah and and if the show is framing and it's very explicit about this like it, it's gonna be critical of the jedi what they represent um the institution I, I don't think it'll be i think here like it's a pretty particular framing of them as sort of like cops just coming up waltzing around the place like going through i mean i think, I think that is that is the framing of like how they are Portray, yeah. portrayed here in in these scenes i think then it's a logical extension that characters in this world would be scared of the powers that have been in the past presented as just like the coolest shit possible like oh <laughs> like, you can just do whatever you want it's like yeah think about that you could just do whatever you want and i don't th- you know i'm not sure it needs like i don't think star wars is necessarily the universe to take that to its logical conclusion of like the all the awful things the Jedi could do with that, but acknowledging s- some of what's going on there, I think is healthy and interesting and adds adds some like actual tension to the boarding of the ship. Um, when that sort right. of shake kind of like almost like shakedown occurs, uh, to yeah. figure out where our you know our main characters hiding. It's what you would feel like if the space cops showed up at your ship and started searching for things. But also, yeah, these are not the droids you're looking for. Is really cool. When yeah. it's just one guy in the middle of the desert, less cool when literally there is an intergalactic <laughs> institution supporting all this action going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if it's just one guy doing, oh yeah, that's cool. If it's literally there's thousands of these people and they can show up at any time and like mess up your shit, uh, not as cool, not as fun anymore in that situation, right? And so I, I, I like that the show kind of brings that out. But anyway, Jedi show up; they're there to investigate the murder of Indara. And a Jedi named Yord and his Padawan show up. Uh, it's clear that he and Osha have some history. Turns out Osha left the Jedi Order six years ago because she was traumatized by her family dying in a fire. And she was in mourning. We all know that Jedi can't have any emotions, so that's like really counterproductive for her trying to be a Jedi. Um, Master and Dara advised the Jedi Council. <laughs> What's your reaction? <laughs> wah, wah. Like, what? What do you mean by that? <laughs> Sorry. Ooh, boo hoo, your family died. Like, yeah. pull, up your, pull up your big boy pants and do yes. your force powers. <laughs> Why don't you go raid some ships and peek around in some people's minds and do something productive? <laughs> Everyone dies. Yeah, yeah. Except not really. Some people become force ghosts. It's a form of privilege the Jedi get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so she was in mourning. Uh, Master Indara apparently advised the Jedi Council to discontinue Osha's training, making Osha a prime suspect for Indara's murder. But Osha claims that leaving the Jedi Order was the hardest decision she ever made. Um, so it's it's really confusing what's going on uh, because Osha does not appear to have wanted to kill M- Master Indara, but we just saw her do it in the opening scene. Have to say... I'm really glad they didn't leave this a mystery for more than one episode. Uh, Cause that would have been pretty irritating. I, you know, the first thing I thought of though was, have you seen the uh, HBO original series, the outsider with Stephen King at adore that show? Great show. And, and essentially what that show asks is what if there was a guy that, or girl mm-hmm. that literally had your DNA, like, Looked like you had your DNA, had your body, and was going around out there murdering people. <laughs> like, w- w- how hard would that be to talk people out of that you actually did that? <laughs> right? That's what that show is mostly about, in my opinion. <laughs> Pretty hard, it turns out. <laughs> Pretty hard, it turns out. Not easy. <laughs> Unfortunately, so, difficult for, for several characters involved in that show. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I thought this show would be. It was like, oh, there's some kind of force... DNA body going yeah, around. Well, it was, out there, it was you know? even have to go one way or the like on some yeah. level the, the the actual reveal of what's going on and we'll get there is the most practical 
explanation. Yeah. And so my mind was like, this either has to go one or two ways. Resolve it real quick with the obvious like potential answer, or it has to be mythical Sith powers that we're unaware of that would allow someone to, you know, take on someone's image or, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cut to Coruscant. It's Lee Jung Jae from Squid Game. Now you don't know him because <laughs> you haven't watched Squid Game. Well, I I know from pop culture, but uh, but he's yes. a he's like an international star. He was obviously the lead in one of the biggest shows on the planet, Squid Game, uh, and it's exciting to see him as a Jedi in this show. He's playing a Jedi named Saul. He's tutoring some kids, including one kid who, by the way, is apparently like a psychopath. I don't know if you noticed that. <laughs> this kid. Uh, He's, he's saying, what do you see? And, he, and this kid's like, I see fire consuming everything around us. <laughs> and by the way, it's set by me. <laughs> he's just like, wow, kind of a dark uh, dream sequence this kid's having. Anyway. Has, has, has he done many English speaking roles before or is this? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. That All right. Of, That's so. really cool. What a, what a like a neat way to, you know, come out of Squid Games and then to. I don't know. Want to be a Jedi? I mean, that's that's that seems pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's pretty awesome. Um, he may have done some English speaking stuff, by the way. I just don't know about it. But uh, gotcha. he was great in Squid Game. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, he meets uh, Master Vanestra, who's played by Rebecca Henderson, who fills him in on what's going on. We learn from Soul that he and Indara actually saved Osha from a terrible fire on Brendock, uh, and says, "quote She saw us as her protectors." Uh, sure seems like Osha might not have killed Indora after all. But Vanessa also tells her, like, they need to get to the bottom of what's going on, and they need to keep things quiet because they have political enemies that might use this incident uh, to attack the Jedi Order. Uh, so potentially, as we mentioned earlier, there might be some cracks in the armor of what's going on with the Jedi at this time. Despite there being unprecedented peace and prosper prosperity, maybe some people don't like getting their minds read against their will. We'll see. <laughs> well, and also, so, who's definition of peace and prosperity you know what i mean i don't know how far like this this series is going to dig into that but, like whose definition of peace and prosperity you know what i mean like is that you know also who are their political enemies i'm not saying they got a point but i just I, you know i wonder what all like there's this there's the sith which is like capital e evil you know sort of against mm -hmm. the jedi and then there's also probably political arguments against the institution of the jedi and how it is currently set up and i i wonder how nuance this show is going to go down the ladder of is like is it as simplistic as like you know the sith are out to get us and they're going to do anything they can to make us look bad or is it like a little more nuanced in terms of hey maybe people don't like the space cops wish yeah. they had some rules around them i don't i don't know where that's gonna kind of gonna ultimately go yeah how big is the uh a jab movement all jedis are bastards anyway got em. cut to cut to we are on a spaceship uh, Osha is in a brig, and uh, all the people around her want to do this uh, prison break. They're they're not happy about being there, and all of a sudden there's a prison break, and it's pretty freaking cool. All the different prisoners use their abilities to bring the ship out of hyperspace and get out of there. Uh, Osha's personal robot Pip falls to the ground, but she can't seem to use the Force at all to retrieve him. She does free this guy who has a parasite stuck to his face, and that guy then runs screaming to the remaining escape pod. Pretty funny stuff. <laughs> uh, the ship then crashes on a nearby winter planet called Karlak. Uh, this was just like a fun. Yeah. This is like such a cool scene. Like it, it's not necessary to move the plot along really. Like they could have just figured out a way to like, they could have cut to, you know, the ship crash lands on a planet or whatever, but it's just like, uh, this is a blast. It's so cool to have this little prison break. And then this little bit about this guy running to the fi final escape pod is just really funny. I thought, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, just just really cool stuff. Any uh, any other reactions to that scene, Patrick Klepek? Well, I, th I think it, you know, be fascinating to see how much of this is present in the series as a whole. But it's uh, it does a decent job of weaving the dramatic and the comedic, which is yeah. inherently part of Star Wars. Like Star Wars yeah. is a funny series. Um, and I think that is something that this that Star Wars has struggled with as it's gotten older and it's trying to cater towards like. A, a, people who loved us as children and became adults and wanted to be a certain way. And like the, the actual, like the bent of that for a lot of people is time to be real serious. I like, can't be funny here. And I, I think, I think this sequence in particular does a pretty great job of, uh, of balancing those two modes. I mean, just the way that little starfish creature like escapes off of his yeah. mouth is, is, so is cool. just the way it really moves cool and like, yeah. and, ups and upsetting, yeah. but also, yeah. yeah, man, get out of here. Like, I don't think you were having a good time 
on that guy. Or maybe you were. I don't know what was going on between the two of you for the last how many, hour many hours. I, uh, <laughs> I, when that guy escaped, I thought he was actually Glenn Howerton from uh, It's Always Sunny Philadelphia. Instead, it's kind of like old British Glenn Howerton. Kind of like, <laughs> anyway. Uh, all right. Back on Coruscant, Sol wants to go to Karlak and bring Osha back herself. Uh, we cut to Karlak. We see that a mysterious figure appears to Osha. It turns out it's Osha's twin sister, May. Osha has a twin <laughs> sister and also has a vision of Brendok. Um, turns out Salt was posted on her home planet, Brendok, and was there when her sister, her, apparently, this is the story that is told, Osha's sister, May, started a fire that killed the entire family and Osha was a sole survivor. Uh, so Sol took her as a Padawan. No one knew that that Osha had a twin. It wasn't in her file, and Sol claims he saw May die. So hmm. unreliable narration going on hmm. there. So who knows what of that is actually true? But anyway, Sol the cops Yord and- wouldn't fabricate evidence. Certainly not <laughs> space cops. Sol Yord and the Padawan arrive on Karlak and set off in search of Osha. Sol stops her from falling off a cliff. We then cut to May and see that she follows a mysterious master whose face we don't see. And apparently it's really important to this guy that the Acolyte doesn't use any weapons. I don't know why, um, but an Acolyte kills without a weapon. An Acolyte kills the dream. That's what he says as we cut to the end of the episode. I'm going to move straight on, Patrick, unless there's anything else you want to say about this one. No. Uh, so in episode two, we're on a planet called Olega at a local Jedi temple. May is there to assassinate another Jedi named Master Tobin. Her first attempt is unsuccessful. Master Tobin appears to be surrounded by one of those invisible walls that mimes uh, interact with, right? <laughs> like you cannot penetrate this. This is a kind of a cool scene where she's trying to oh, attack yeah. this thing and she can't, she can't get through it. So that, I yeah, that I, cool. the, the multiple attempts, it's, it goes on just long enough that right. it becomes uncomfortable and then funny again. And, yeah. but it doesn't, play it for laughs like again i think it's smart filmmaking where they're it's it's deathly serious but also profoundly funny to watch because we because we see like it's a payoff for killing carrie on moss where it's like you you see what she's capable of and then she gets right. here and it's just flailing in front of this guy right. who wants you know want nothing to do with her it's very good so may meets up with now we Patrick and I had a really hard time finding the pronunciation of this guy's name. But this actor is played by Manny Jacinto. And his the character's name is Q-I-M-I-R. So I think it's Kimir. Kimir. But That's I'm what we settled sure. on as our canonically potentially wrong. Right, right. We, we looked up. Wait, look. We looked up several interviews <laughs> waiting for someone to say the character's name. Say his name. Say, and not nothing. Could not. They could, say could not they get. actually maybe say his name at most once or twice in this episode, right? So like didn't we did not catch it, but it's Q I M I R. We'll pronounce it Kimir for now until we know otherwise. Anyway, we learned that May wants poison, even though her master doesn't want her to use poison. And also that she has three other Jedi to kill, including Master Tobin. So May comes back to kill Master Tobin and confronts him. And she confronts him saying, I know why you took the Barash vow. Now, according to Wikipedia, Wikipedia, the Barash vow was an oath taken by Jedi who completely refrained from all activities related to the Jedi Order as a form of penitence, disengaging from anything but the Force itself and committing themselves to gaining ultimate communion with it. The vow was named after Jedi Master Barash Sylvain, who originated the practice. Although most Jedi who swore the vow did so as a method of atonement, some did it in order to refocus themselves on the Force, end quote. Uh, I, I kind of like little lore drops like this. Mm -hmm. If you're a huge Star Wars fan, you'll know what the Barash vow is. If you're not a Star Wars fan, you can kind of figure it out from the context what it is. It's, this is the way I think it should be done. Um, so I was a fan of this stuff. Uh, but yeah, uh, clearly Master Tobin is haunted by some stuff. Torbin, I should say, is haunted by some stuff. Um, May offers Torbin poison uh, as a way of atoning for his sins. And he actually asks May for forgiveness right before he drinks it. So clearly something bad went down on Brendock mm -hmm. that we are not yet privy to. Mm -hmm. So at about this time, Sol and the others are converged on the location. They find Torben's dead body and realize that the poison is Bunta from Osha's home planet. Um, so they realize that it has to have come from nearby. May goes into an apothecary impersonating her sister. This is the apothecary guy, Kimir, played by Manny Jacinto. They interrogate Kimir, who doesn't admit much other than that. May has a few more Jedi to kill. Four total who were stationed on Brendok 15 years ago. Only Sol, 
the Lee Jung Jae character, and another Jedi named Kelnaka remain. In the final scenes, Manny offers to get May out of the city and to Kelnaka to meet the Jedi Wookiee on Kofar is the name of the planet. So Kelnaka is the guy is the Wookiee's name, I believe. Kofar is the name of the planet, and he is a Jedi Wookiee. So, which is I think the first time that we have seen a Jedi Wookiee in a live action Star Wars franchise. I know there have been Jedi Wookiees, I think, in the Bad Batch before. But um, this is the first time we've seen a Star Wars series. And that's where episode two ends. So, Patrick Lepic, any thoughts on the episode? Uh, and, and by the way, I wanted to do this thing that I'm sure a lot of people will be fans of mm. called D- Dave's Nitpick Corner. Oh, Dave's Nitpick where I, Corner. I, I know, we got to make some song. Dave's Nitpick Corner. So we got to do a little bit of a... Uh, so, so I'll save it to the end. It's like all my annoying nerd stuff that you shouldn't <laughs> listen to nitpicks that may not actually make any sense and or are completely incoherent so like stay tuned for that i'll put that way at the end so you don't even need to listen to any of this stuff i'm gonna um, even log off the call J- david's just gonna talk to yeah himself. it's just gonna be uh, me patrick's not even gonna be here uh but yeah patrick any other thoughts on uh on this episode of uh of the show yeah, w- one uh, thing that i c- couldn't get out of my head i did not know that they had cast Mana jacinto in this show that had just kind of gone gone past me despite paying attention to kind of like casting and these shows as they're coming out. I, the Good Place is a wonderful show. I, I I love so much about that show, especially the message it has sort of about death and life at, at the end. And he is such a highlight in that show, but he's just hasn't been in very much since. Um, he was, was apparently cast in uh, Top Gun Maverick. I saw Appar- that, but I don't remember him. Right. right. In it. Well, well. Apparently, he like did a lot of training for that movie as well, and um, and then his role was completely cut from the film. Oh. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Because I, I, I when when my wife and I were watching the show, and about halfway through his first scene, I pause. I'm like, "Hey, is that?" And she, my yeah. wife, was like, "I think so." And then you know, he makes a pretty then, big transformation for the show, which is cool. Like I, I love it, when it's an actor such a yeah, yeah. go look up any clip from from yeah. from the good place. He plays such, I mean, he plays just the the biggest dumbass in in the good place. Dumbass with a really good heart. Loves the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, um, just great, 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 great character. But like the polar op, like just completely other side of the spectrum in terms of presentation. And so it was just it was a delight to see him here in something completely different. I, I wonder if some, like the kind of specific character he plays in the good place has just prevented him from finding like good pivots after that. But it was wonderful to see him here. I don't know how much he'll be in the show uh, at large, or if this is just kind of a one-time thing, but I, he really stuck out. He's, he's an actor I really liked in the good place. I like, I like him here uh, as well. And so he just sort of stuck out to me just because I was, it came as such a surprise. Uh, I just did not expect him to to be here, but um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I think part of, my struggle with the show is that because it's presenting itself as a bit of a mystery box, like, hey, part of what's going to be interesting about what's happening here is what is at the heart of all of it. And what's like we are deliberately withholding answers that the characters right. are going to find along the way. And it doesn't mean the show can't be interesting as it goes along. I just by the second episode, I felt more on track with the characters, um, maybe because I had more information. Um, but uh, it just took me a minute to settle settle in with them and now that it's presenting itself as a as a mystery show you know that comes with its own hurdles right where it, 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 those mysteries are going to have to pay off in some satisfying way for all of this to fully click into place and you know we're not talking about a 12 episode season right i think we have six episodes right i think six episodes i don't think it's a ton and they're all roughly 30 to 40 minutes so it's just not a ton of runtime to to pay off the story uh and look you should tell the story that you want to tell it's it's, it's eight Is episodes it eight? okay eight, eight episodes Still- and and they spent 180 million dollars on the show uh these I, budgets I, these budgets man like i i i uh uh I mean, it looks expensive. First, first of all, it, it, uh, this this is a show that looks like it costs. It looks a lot great. Of money. Looks wonderful. It looks, yes, it looks great. Also, you know, I didn't mention that uh, May and Soul have a confrontation and they have a little fight scene. And my colleague on the film cast, Devendra, compared it to. There's a very similar fight scene in uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. I think it's probably an homage to that. But yeah, I'm, and Lee Jung Jae knows how to handle himself with a great physicality as well. Like yeah. he he does a great job in this 
in this show as well. This is a show that demands a lot of all of its actors. I it think. does. And everyone is bringing their A game to this. And uh, I thought that fight scene was great. Like, this is, these are fight scenes that tell you stuff about the characters. That's, that's all you can ask for, in my opinion. I don't know. This is so weird, Patrick. I feel like I'm warmer on the show than you, which is just odd. Because because <laughs> when we got to, when we went to Ahsoka, I like really mm-hmm. I'm just strongly dra- dragging just dragging like David from episode, and I know get up, get up. I got yeah. you. I got you. Like, put your hand right. on my shoulder. We're going to episode six. Um, I'm not but, down on. I think I'm. I guess I'm wrestling with. Uh, like it was checking every box from a pitch perspective. I just. I guess. I guess I expected to love it more out of the gate. I like it. I'm not, I, I, I definitely like the show. I guess I just expected to love it more out of the gate. And I'm, I'm hoping I'll warm up to more in a more full capacity as we go along. But I fully agree with you on the, the res. I will like the resolutions to various fights in these two episodes have been really satisfying in that they've been unexpected. Like having this character, like lose all their knives and then may looks at the ground and uses the force and dust. It's like, these are wizards yes. that, you know, can pull down buildings and like whip things around and do unbelievable things. And the way she gets away is, you know, what's really annoying is when you get dust in your eye. <laughs> like they didn't teach that at the <laughs> Jedi Academy where like, uh, for, it's force, a classic anti dust. It's like the magician throwing down a thing of smoke and then disappear, you know, but and it's great. It's, it's, it's really, it's really clever. It's, uh, it's just, it's, if the show continues to deliver on that front over and over, which is, hey, we're setting up a very familiar dynamic. We have three force users in front of each other. Like, what are they going to do? Well, I guess they're all going to pull out their lightsabers and hopefully, like, the lightsaber yeah. fights are interesting. Like, that's sort of what you expect. And here, like, there's still lightsabers. There's still force powers. But it, it really seems like they've thought through what is something unique we can do about a very familiar setup? And even if that results in a character getting away, I I found that to be very satisfying because it's not how I'm used to watching these sequences resolve themselves. Yeah, yeah. I think part of your hesitation, if I'm hearing you correctly, is like we don't really know what the show is at this point. Like yeah. we, we don't know. So much of what information we've been presented is clearly from unreliable narrators. We don't know who this mystery guy is. Even May doesn't seem to know who this mystery guy is. So it's like, is is that mystery guy going to be some cool guy that we are already aware of? Or is it going to be Darth Vader's dad or some shit? Like, you know, like, we don't know anything, right? So, I, like, I, you know. I really disagree with Disney's choice to only send critics for the six episodes or for the, the eight episodes. Like, I, re- I part, part of... I, I wish I had, you know, with these sorts of shows, like I get it. Like you're trying to withhold, the, you know, yeah, the big reveals, the end, or whatever, yeah. but especially for a show that is it's it's a mystery show. Like it's yeah. it's it's a murder mystery show. And so at least from a critical perspective, I think it does the show a disservice to not let like out of the gate. People get a better sense of like, does right. it does it resolve? Like, you know, um, right, like, right. you know, True Detective wasn't afraid of that. So uh, I don't know. It's, it's just one of those things, but I'm, I'm rooting for it. There's all sorts of other things it's doing well. It's like, well, if it's nailing that stuff, hopefully it's going to be just as thoughtful with the storytelling. And, you know, the showrunner did, you know, uh, what was the, uh, uh, the, the time travel show on Netflix that she did before, before Russian, Russian doll. doll. Um, I didn't watch that second season, but adored the first season. I want to just give a shout out to the, the cast of the show. There's just like all these people in the show that you've you've seen before in various contexts. Charlie Barnett, I think, plays Yord. He was the main dude on Russian Doll. And Daphne Keene plays the parallel one. She was the uh, girl that Logan was taking care of in the movie Logan. Uh, and she's complete badass in that movie. Seems to have some skills in this show as well. So it's uh, just cool to see all these like different actors come together in, in a cool and interesting way. So, uh, But I, that said, I totally understand your reservations. And maybe the show will turn out to be bad. I have to say... The first two episodes have each had at least one really good action scene. And if they can continue that trend, even even just that, well, I'll be really happy with. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see whether the plot evolves into something interesting and insightful. Uh, but so far, I, David Chan, am a fan of The Acolyte. Patrick Klepek <gasps> likes it a little bit more uh, reserved than I am, though. So quite an interesting uh, dynamic reversal here. <laughs> but Patrick Klepek, let's talk about Dave's nitpick corner. 
And some of the nitpicks I had. Pick, 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 pick. Work on workshopping ideas. I'm trying yeah, to... you're work, workshopping theme song ideas. Mm-hmm, now, mm-hmm. I just want to say, before you listen to this, uh, this following segment should be listened to by no one, and you should not take it seriously <laughs> whatsoever, okay? Do, do not get upset about anything I say, because it's no one... It will benefit no one, and it will waste your energy, all right? <laughs> In fact, it's a waste of my energy to even mention any of these things that I'm about to say, but I'm going to anyway. Mm-hmm. All right, here we go. Patrick Lepic. <laughs> Hit me. I'm ready to be socked with a nitpick. Really sort of totally fine with how they dealt with the fact that Osha had a twin sister. As I mentioned, they, they kind of, I think within one episode, you find out what happened, right? Like within, yeah. before the end of the first episode, you know, she's got a twin. The twin probably did the murder. Uh, there you go. Right. So love that. I love that journey for us. Uh, the one thing that I am a little bit curious about is, isn't it coincident, Patrick Lepic, that both May and Osha decided to have the exact same hairstyle despite having been separated since they were ch- children? You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because um, if they hadn't, then uh, literally none of this would make any sense. Like, they wouldn't have ever been mistaken for each other at any point in time, probably. Isn't uh, she trying so, to? So, you think part of her plan is doesn't she want to be mistaken? Does she? I don't know. Well, for like five seconds? Because that's because it's not like that's a um like she's trying to get she's trying to frame her sister. I don't think that's the case. I don't think you care. She doesn't seem to care about that. Maybe later on we're gonna find out May tried to frame her sister, and that's why she kept the same hairstyle. Uh but if so, that was a stupid plan because it only worked for oh, about 40, no, no, that's 30 that, no, that can't be true because part one of the plot points is that they actually don't know the other is alive. alive right? right. So yeah. okay, that that only furthers your your point. So about it's just it's just hair. a huge coincidence that they happen to have the same hairstyle after all this time. So mm. it's like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe there's a canonical plot reason for that, but otherwise feels pretty pretty convenient. Mm-hmm. All right, my second and final nitpick for this episode. At one point in time, Osha talks about what happened after she left the Jedi Order. She became a mechnic, which is a apparently a very dangerous job. I like how some sci-fi. This is I, I genuinely am saying this. I like how some sci-fi fantasy that they use like real words from our world, but it's like slightly different. So, for instance, in Game of Thrones, you'll have like Sir Jora, but Sir is spelled S E R. You mm-hmm. see, so that's how you know it's not from our planet. And here they have mechanics instead of mechanics. You know, they help repair ships and they do it in dangerous situations. Uh, and anyway, Osha says at one point, "Oh, I needed a paycheck." And I, I got this flashback to when in Lord of the Rings, one of the orcs said, it looks like meat's on the menu today, boys. And it's like, how would an orc know what a, a menu is? Like, how, how would a, an orc understand the concept of a menu? You know, similarly, uh, Osha needing a paycheck, like a paycheck is a very earth bound mm-hmm. concept. I mean, look, uh, by the way, fun fact, apparently. For for a long time, paper was not canonically in the Star Wars universe. Like, the, yeah, the, the, I in saw Star that. Wars, yeah, they didn't use paper at all. Um, now, apparently, that's no longer true. Like, canonically, Anakin Skywalker has used paper. I looked this up on Wikipedia, so you know, <laughs> the important stuff. Anymore. <laughs> How dare you ridicule <laughs> Dave's nip? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm in nitpick corner. The I need, inaugural I'm sorry, I... edition. Of Dave's nitpick editors, corner, Patrick. Cut that, cut that. Sorry, <laughs> cut that, cut that, cut that, cut that. I'm the editor, by the way. <laughs> I'm aware. I'm. That's that's the joke. Okay, Jesus. so nitpicking so, my jokes in nitpick corner. Come on. Where does the term check come from? According to the online etymology dictionary, a check was first used in the 1800s as a counter register, as a token of ownership, to check against and prevent loss or theft, like a hat check. You know, if you're going to a, a, an opera, sure. Or Hence, also the financial use for written order for money drawn on a bank or money draft, uh, often spelled check C H E Q U um, E, or also mark put against names or items on a list indicating they have been verified or otherwise examined. These are all terms that came from the from uh, from Earth in the uh, 1700s. Now that then evolved into paycheck. Uh, which is and th- which is a physical paper form that would tell you how much you get paid, uh, and now we we do it all digitally. So maybe Patrick Klepek in the Star Wars universe, paychecks evolved, like like there is a universe where paychecks evolved differently, where 
checks, quote unquote, were all done using like computer terminals and like mm-hmm. digital terminals mm-hmm. and stuff. Mm-hmm. But putting aside that extremely tortured explanation, I call bullshit on paychecks. I, th- I, I mean, part, <laughs> part of the line with this stuff is like the line has to be either like sufficiently conveying an idea or sufficiently cool to get away with it. And like the line in Lord of the Rings is fucking awesome. <laughs> like it's so, it's it's a great like. I th- I I remember when that line happened in the movie. I was like, "That's." I wasn't thinking about how that didn't make any right. sense. I was like, "That's just a good line." And so I think it that's l- looks that's, like meats back on the menu, boys. That's the line from Lord of the Rings. Right? Yeah, it's so. so good. It's it delivered well. It's, yes. It fits the moment, and yeah. I think that's the line you're writing when it's not like a continuity break, but when that kind of like not even a fourth wall, but like when you're sort of breaking reality a bit from the narrative that you're in, it's got like it's got to go hard, or it has to be worth worth it. Because you know you're going to lose. Most people aren't going to pick up on it. I, like, there's a I, lot of David Chen's in the world. No, they're, they're going to be. In <laughs> no, I think I think 99 percent of people are not would never even notice that mm. phrase. And someone extremely annoying like me comes along and introduces a Dave Nippet corner and says, "Why would they have a concept of a paycheck in Star Wars? I mean, a, and if I don't they know, did, you say there's not many like you, but I, I feel like." <laughs> The internet has proven that's not true, David. I think there's too many like you. <laughs> I'm not uh, against the concept of a paycheck in the uh, Star Wars universe. Obviously, people get paid. Oh, you don't want money. people to get paid. You don't want you, you're you're no. anti David anti labor <laughs> Chen. <laughs> I'm not against people getting paid. I'm uh, I'm simply questioning whether they would call that idea a paycheck. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? It it stre- it it it's, it stretches the bounds of credulity that it would be called a paycheck in the Star Wars universe. That's all I have to say about that. So, who could disagree with that? Well, Patrick, what do you what do you think of the first edition of Dave's Nitpick Corner? Was that at all enjoyable, even in an ironic way? I got to be honest. I think I think we should lean into this. I think people <laughs> should write in with their nitpicks. I will write yeah. down my nit. I, this is like bonus oh, yeah. pod material. Dave, yeah, like, just, right. we could just yeah. let's knit these picks. Like let's go. Like everyone, the other way, the other it, way around. <laughs> Don't nitpick. <laughs> Stop it. I'm gonna hit you with a stick. Um, but I think the thing about nitpicks is I, I'm able to let a lot of it. Like this comes up a lot with my colleague Rob Zachney. Like he's mm-hmm. someone who gets hung up on this stuff too. Same way that you do. I'm just allowed things just wash over me. But I can allow myself to go into nitpick corner. You just need to. I need to situate myself there. And the thing mm-hmm. about a nitpick is that it's an expression of like individual personality. Yes. Like eccentricities. Cause like what rises to something that bugs you and like, that's just different and very personal for. And so I think, I think we should lean into this. I think people should write in with their nitpicks and we should, we should pile them up and we should normalize nitpicking uh, here on the podcast. Yeah. In a fun, ironic way, as opposed to, making like toxic YouTube videos. Hey everyone, David Chen here. Thank you so much for watching that video from Decoding TV. If you want to get an audio version of the show, all you got to do is go to podcast.decodingtv.com. And if you want to support what we do, get ad-free episodes of the podcast and also bonus episodes of the podcast, go to decodingtv.com and become a paid member. Of course, you can also like and subscribe for more. We appreciate it. Thanks. See you later.